please let's welcome Sanjay with a big round of applause. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. Hi, everybody. So today I'll be talking about how we scale Genus using Kubernetes. And I will be going through the journey, how we took the des design decisions and all the things we did while scaling Genus. First of all, let me introduce you to our company which we are working on. Uh, Unacademy is the India's largest learning platform. We have like we bring the educators together with millions of learners for the quality education. We currently uh, have 11 k edu educators and 11 million learners across India, Indonesia, and Brazil. We have uh, iOS and mobile app as well as we are web-based. We are present in web, iOS and Android platforms. Let me go through with the, uh, our story. Like initially, we started off in 2015 and initially we were video on demand service. But later on, we realized the potential of going live and we had a lot of traction. So uh, one year back, in July 2018, we started off with uh, exper experimenting with Genes, and we did. We started with initially 10 classes per month. Now over the year, we have gone by. We have scaled up to 37 classes per month. We generally attend around 1,000 classes per day. So let me get you how we scale Genes up to uh, handle this scale. Initially, we started off with normal Genus video room. In this, we uh, one uh, the publisher would be connecting to the video room, and then there will be learners. So initial initially we had not uh, we didn't face any problems because we had less the amount of learners and we had few educators. So it was very the initial design of Genus was very going good until we had bottlenecks of too many learners and the educators were also growing. Then this design had few bottlenecks, which were we were incurring a lot of operational cost. And we had limitation on the AWS instances. And we were having limitations on number of users, which were connecting to the video room. And this model was not scalable. So we came up with the second design, which was, we introduced a second layer of repeat, the second layer, which would be a bridge between Genus Video Room and Streaming Plugin. So what we did was, through Video Room, we started off passing the RTB streams to Streaming Plugin, and those were in uh, the and every uh, the educator would be connecting to Video Room, and the learners would be connecting to separate streaming plugins. So each plugin would be running on the separate instance. This was all on a single uh, individual AWS EC2 instances. In this design, this solved our problem of uh, too many users at a one class. We scaled up to around 4,000 users in a single class using this design. But this design also had some issues, like we, were, we had to spin off a lot of a EC2 instances for a single class. Because as the number of users grow, so we need to fork uh, another EC2 instance, which will forward the traffic from repeater to that instance. So this design also had some issues. We were incurring, again, the lot of operational costs. And AWS has like limitation on number of instances we can spin off at the moment. And this, this was not also scalable enough so that we were not able to handle, this was not good enough to keep us going for the next year. So we thought of moving all, we thought of removing the bottlenecks from this part, this streaming plugin and a video room plugin. So we thought of moving these all to containers and moving, the, moving these things to containers solved the, most of the problems. When we moved these to containers, we had like, we faced some problems of delay in the video streaming, but most of the problems like operational costs went down by 60% and we now 
we don't have the limitation of AWS instances, and we were scaling it very fast. As the number of users uh, keep on attending the classes, it automatically scales up the traffic, and we we don't have to bother about uh, how we manage the things. So this was the solution. We what we did was we ran every class in a container, and the containers would auto scale on the number of as the learners increase. This was our final design. How we came up with this? This was we used Kubernetes for this. First, we what we did was we moved everything uh, Janus into the containers, and we used Kubernetes for managing the containers. This this is our Kubernetes cluster. This is our load balancer, which handles the incoming traffic from the learners. These are our individual classes, and each class runs on a pod. This is a terminology of Kubernetes for representing a container. So every class will have initially we what we do, we have a class scheduler. So whenever a class is going to happen, whenever the educator comes online, so when it's Start to late when it will do start a class. Then the class scheduler will spin off, spin off a, spin off one uh, two pods with one auto scaler for the individual class. So as the class will progress and number of users will join the class, then the auto scaler based on the number of connections, WebSocket connection it is making to the pods, it will scale the pods automatically. Similarly. This is this is Redis we use for the service discovery. Service discovery was required because in this design I have discussed about this repeater. Now this has to be done very in a dynamic way. We don't because at the start we don't know how many learners would be connecting to our uh, would be joining to a class. So we needed a way to figure out how which IPs we need to send the data. Data I mean the RTMP stream from the video video room plugin. So what we did, we solved this using a service discovery, which we made using Redis. So whenever a pod comes up, it registers with the service discovery, and this information is passed to the educator educator pod. Now the educator pod will send the will send both audio, video, and data to this stream. Now when, now whenever a auto scaler comes or this case spins off another pod so this pod will register first itself to the discovery part then discovery will send the, that ip to the learner pod in this way the stream will be available to these pods also now the learner would be joining the coming pod and the traffic will be uh, routed to all connecting learners and for log and this is like our log collector what we did was we install we use fluentd for log collection so whatever logs are generated in individual genus those logs are collected and they are processed via elk stack now the cluster in this cluster we can run as many classes as we can we have every pod is a genus instance and we have like restriction on the amount of memory and amount of CPU uses each pod would be running. Now, after the class is over, we uh, process the video, and that video is available for offline viewing of the viewer. Whenever he gets a chance, so he can view the class later on also. Now, the deployment part. We deployed whole of the. We managed the deployment pipeline using Jenkins. Ansible, Packer, and Terraform. Jenkins for making the pipeline, Packer for making the Docker images and the containerization part, and Ansible for handling the AWS resources. Next, load testing. Load testing was the hardest thing for us to do because we have to simulate the live user and its actions. In our live class, the learner can call, we have an interactive session. So when the learner joins a class, he can he can respond to polls, he can respond to the questions being asked, and he can uh, interact via chat with the class 
class other class members so while taking care of this while load testing we have to take care of all these things and we have to make sure everything works and we are we are testing every component of the class so what we did was we simulated all the client using a headless chrome and then we automated whole the testing process uh, and we integrated this load testing in the deployment process whenever we make a new release or whenever a new genesis release so we pull it and the testing goes through the pipeline and next thing is logging and monitoring this was the hardest part because in this design we don't know when something goes wrong we don't know which learner is connected to which pod and this is hardest thing to debug and we had a lot of challenges and we are still figure working on how to figure out and handle these things very effectively we built some solutions around this and still are working on this so we did achieve using this using fluentd the open source part of fluentd and elk for managing the logs grafana and prometheus for visualizing the logs and the cpu CPUs and the mat other metrics, and we use the uh, wheel dashboard for the monitoring of the Kubernetes cluster, and we have the deployment cl uh, dashboard of EK def by default EKS. Let me get you. Let me show you the dashboard for that. this is this is whole our network looks like complete this is a live cluster so these are So these the middle ones rows they represent the load balance auto scaler for each class, and they are also the endpoints for receiving the traffic for each class. And these are the serving ports. These are the individual Genesis instances which are which 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 only run the streaming plugin and they are receiving data from repeater, and they are streaming to users. The lines which you are seeing is the traffic which we are. handling right now the current traffic this is and this is our live class actually looks like let me give you this we are connecting to a real classroom some issue with this
I think there is some issue, so I can't show it right now. That's it. That was all. Thanks, Ajay. It's, it's an impressive setup, so uh, you handle a lot of users, so congratulations on that. Uh, do we have any questions for Sanjay? Oh, a couple there, so. Uh, why Kubernetes and not Swarm? Why? Why? Yeah, there were two issues with, matlab, while taking up the decision for going for Kubernetes, the issue was when if we use Swarm, then we had to uh, lot of do lot of things to do in terms of networking. Uh, we use Kubernetes because we already had the EKS service for, uh, of Amazon, which which gives a lot of which keeps us from doing lot of things operationally because we don't go we don't want it to go for all the DevOps and all the networking stuff which we have to overlay if we go if we had used swarm then we had to lay overlay network and we have to keep on like we had to deal with issues of load balancing the things which we could have easily done in EKS because EKS has uh, Kubernetes has two planes control plane and data plane and control plane is managed by Amazon AWS so we had like this oh, benefit of using we had this benefit so we moved to EKS instead of uh, moved to Kubernetes instead of using it using Docker Swarm and moreover uh, it it has like less management issues Docker Swarm we had to manage a lot of things Okay, I have uh, two questions. First one is, uh, can you talk more about uh, Kubernetes configuration? Yeah. Uh, which kind of service uh, you are using? Uh, how do you config the network of a Docker container? And the uh, second question is, uh, as the I have seen in the picture, you are using the load balance uh, service from AWS. How do you configure it? Because uh, uh, in in the case when you scale down your instances, my uh, some clients may lose the connection unexpectedly. Uh, the first question is like we use. Uh, a EK service of Amazon for uh, containerizing. We use Packer for building the images, and uh, for managing Kubernetes, we use the uh, Kubernetes API. So we use that for configuring and managing the things. And what was your second question? A second question is how do you configure uh, the load balancer? Uh, the load balancer, yeah, yeah, yeah. which I have so seen shown here is a part of ingress in kubernetes ingress is a thing ingress is the gateway for kubernetes kubernetes cluster so when we use eks so i mean we can directly incorporate the alb uh, alb of alb which is provided by aws directly into the kubernetes cluster so we have we configure it using y yml files which are standard which are a standard for kubernetes Okay. Um, excuse, excuse me. The first question. I'm not clear. What type of service uh, you are using? What? What kind of service in the Kubernetes uh, configuration file is you are using? What kind of service? Yeah, yeah. We use two service. One is Nodeport, okay, and Nodeport. other is Headless service. Okay. Headless we use because we we uh, here we are dealing with web sockets and we needed to or manage the load balance the traffic based on web sockets okay. now the in the uh, the service which is provided by kubernetes doesn't handle well doesn't works well with web sockets so we made it headless and okay. we uh, use envoy proxy 
for distributing the traffic among the ports. Okay. And uh, how about uh, node ports? Uh, how about node node port? Node port. Yeah, yeah. Node port is the ingress port. Okay. Which okay. is directly connected to ambassador. Okay. Ambassador is another proxy built on envoy. Okay. And uh, how about uh, Docker container? How many ports uh, you are opening? How many ports? Yeah. We actually we have a proxy inside that, so we open only two ports: HTTP and HTTPS, eighty and four forty three. Okay. We route the internal traffic via proxy, okay. an Linux proxy. Okay. Uh, thanks. Hi. Uh, one more question: uh, When you do scale up the Janus instances with yeah. Kates, uh, when is the decision what you make when you make to roll out a new pod, for example. Yeah, Do this you limit the bandwidth or number of users, rooms or... This we this we have customized. We don't use the autoscaler of Kubernetes. So we wrote our own autoscaler and that autoscaler checks for the number of users connecting to Janus and how much the how much maximum Janus can handle at that point. So we continuously monitor the running Janus pods and if we find ki we are we have a sudden burst of traffic based on number of users being connected to a single port, then we fork a new port. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have some more questions for Sanjay? Oh, sorry. Um, over here. I, I was wondering, you mentioned that you do recordings as well. Can you talk a little bit about how you solve that? Do you, what kind of components do you have in the classroom? Is there a whiteboard? Or do you allow sharing of files? How do you synchronize all these different the, uh, content we types? Have, we, have, we allow educators to upload for, uh, PDFs. Then we convert those PDFs into slides. And we have a whiteboard. Then what we do is we store every event of whiteboard whenever the educator writes we store those events back then after the class is over we pre-process those events and we record the screen using puppeteer uh, open source tool then we make recording using that so yeah we post-process uh, after we have a post-process in genus post-processing in genus when the class ends when educator ends the class then we receive that event Based on that event, we handle two things. One, we have an educator video and audio. And one other thing, we have the events drawn on the whiteboard. Now, first, we collate the video. And then we collate the whiteboard events and the educator video into one. The, the collation of video is done by FFmpeg. And other part is then, then we do it using Puppeteer. One question here. Yeah. Congrats for this wide-scale deployment. Thank you. Um, out of curiosity, is all this that you have been describing a monodirectional application scenario, or do you allow learners to also inject their media to the virtual room? Let's right say. now, we are monodirectional, but we are going for bidirectional later using audio bridge. Well, what we have planned is the educator will stream the video and he can the learners can ask their doubts or whatever they want to say using video using audio so no video uh, no video okay and did you ever think of making this become a tree based distribution architecture where you have different layers of relays things like that in order to increase scalability uh, right now no, no. Not necessarily peer-to-peer. -peer. I was thinking of something more traditional style, like forwarding pipes of media uh, we between have, different layers. We have thought of this in this part, uh, repeating the stream to the streaming plugin. So but that repeater is not just one layer. It might be multiple layers of relayers? Yeah, there will be multiple layers. When the number of users to users become large, Suppose we hit 60, more than 20k users at a time, then that we in that scenario we need the multiple layers over here. So it's vertical scaling. Then. Yeah, vertical scaling. So you are you have arrived at Lorenzo's PhD thesis now. <laughs>
Thanks a lot. Do we have some more questions for Sanjay? Now let's give him one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And the last presentation for today is uh, from uh, one of one more or the the Miteko guys. Uh,